Thank you for joining us in our virtual commemoration of Yom HaShoah. This year, although we gather not physically together, but only spiritually and emotionally as a community to commemorate Yom HaShoah, we can still remember. We are told never forget. Never forget when we are teaching. Never forget when we are praying. Never forget when we are learning. Never forget when we are together. Never forget when we are at home. Never forget. Memory is crucial in Judaism. Memory is essential to who we are as a people. It binds us to others. It helps us know to whom we belong. And in Judaism, memory is not passive, it is active. Understanding and interpretations of the past have shaped Jewish identity and collective memory throughout the ages. And Jews represent a unique fusion of history, memory, and peoplehood. In his masterwork on the subject, Zachor, Jewish History and Jewish Memory, the historian Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi notes that the Hebrew word for remember, Zachor, is repeated nearly 200 times in the Hebrew Bible, with both Israel and God commanded to remember to remember the Sabbath, to remember the covenant, to remember the exodus from Egypt. As Yerul Shami suggests, one might argue that the commandment to remember has been central to the survival of the Jews over thousands of years. Remember, our Torah tells us, transmit Judaism from one generation to the next by living Judaism, memories and living go hand in hand. As you watch this video, you are helping memories and living go hand in hand. This year, we remember 75 years since the end of World War II and the liberation of the survivors. 77 years since the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the 57th anniversary of the dedication of the memorial to the Six Million. Soon, Second-hand memories will be all that is left. And when the last survivor is able to share his or her story with us, it becomes our job to share their memories. Torah too teaches us this lesson. Repeated throughout the Torah, we are told to do more than remember. We are told to remember and to never forget. Commentary notes times that the Torah obligates Jews to remember something and also not to forget it. Its first example is Shabbat, where the Torah tells us Zachor, remember in one place, and Shamor, guard, in another. The guarding takes care of being sure not to forget. In Deuteronomy, we are told to remember and not forget how we angered God in the desert. We are also told in Deuteronomy to remember and not forget what happened to Miriam. And of course, we are told to both remember and never forget what Amalek did to our people. In modern day, we have many ways to both remember and never forget. For me, one of those moments came when I was living in Israel. As many of you know, in Israel on Yom HaShoah at 10 a.m., a siren sounds and every person stops immediately what they are doing. If they are walking, they stop. If they are driving, they stop and get out of their cars. If they are at work, they stop. If they are eating a meal, they stop. The whole country stands still to remember and never forget for two minutes. As one who is uncomfortable with silence, these two minutes seemed like an eternity but they were also some of the most impactful minutes of my life. Those two minutes showed me that there are many ways to remember and never forget. We can be silent. We can speak out. We can learn. We can teach. We can commemorate in person or even via video. However we do it, we must remember and never forget. 
That makes our job hard because it is more than to never forget. Once there are no firsthand accounts to tell, we must also share their memories. No matter if we are together in the white theater or watching as individuals at home, let us share their memories so no one can ever forget. Let us join with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education to teach, to learn, and to commemorate. And when we do, we will both remember and never forget. Hello, my name is Mary Kovitz, and I'm honored to be the chairperson for this year's Yom HaShoah Memorial Service. My parents were Rose and Leo Zemelman, both Holocaust survivors. My parents attended this service for as long as I can remember, and they always made sure that my sister and I attended with them. I've even participated as a candle lighter. But this year is much different uh, since we're not meeting in person all together. I'm going to try to tell my parents' story on the internet. Each and every survivor has a story and today I get to tell theirs. My mother was born Rosa Weiss and grew up in Sostowitz, Poland as the youngest of three daughters. To hear her tell it, she was the life of the party. She was the apple of her father's eye and she liked to play and play with her friends and run around rather than stay at home with her sisters and learn how to take care of a house and cook. Uh, she had a beautiful singing voice and if the war hadn't uh, happened, she would have gone to a conservatory, to, a music conservatory to study voice. On the day that she was captured, her mother had seen Nazi activity on the street below their apartment. She got worried and she told my mom to climb out the, her bedroom window. So my mother had one leg out the window and as she got ready to put her other leg out, she felt somebody grab it and it was one of the Nazi soldiers and they had her. Uh, they took her and hundreds of other women to a holding area I can't remember if she told me it was a church or a school or a police station, but she was there. Her father was um, a tailor and he had many uh, important non-Jewish clients. So he thought they would help him get her out. He went down to wherever she was being held with tears in his eyes. And he told her, don't worry, honey, I will get you out. You'll get released, you'll be back home. That was the last she ever saw him. So she was sent to a labor camp and she said it could have been worse. She worked and in the evening they were fed and she would sing song, requested songs from the other girls and the guards. Now her guard really enjoyed the songs she sang. They reminded her of her childhood. So she took care of my mother. She gave her extra food. Um, my mother also was, not just my mother, all of the people in the labor camp, they were allowed to receive letters from home. So my mother thought she was receiving letters from her mother telling her that the family was okay, they were doing all right, and they missed her and they would see her soon. But in reality, it was my aunt Ida Bengus, who's also from Kansas, who also came to Kansas City, who was forging these letters um, because soon after my mom was taken, her parents were taken um, and my aunt never really found, I don't think they found out where my grandparents, where they ended up, but we knew they died during the Holocaust. Anyway, my, my, my mother also had an older sister, Franya. Franya was married and she had a five-year-old boy named Abramush. And when my uh, Aunt Franya and her husband and the baby were captured, Franya could have lived, uh, but she chose to go with the Bromish and they were killed. And we don't know what happened to her husband. He was probably killed also. Okay, um, my mother spent the next three years in va various labor camps performing slave labor but she always hoped that 
it would be over soon. And it was. In 1942, no more labor camps. The final solution was put into place. It was adopted as official policy of the Nazi regime. And basically what it was, it was the decision to exterminate the entire Jewish population of Europe. Um, my mother spent the remainder <clears throat> of the war being shuffled from one camp to another, never really knowing if the next day would be her last. Her last camp was Bergen-Belsen, and there she was reunited with her sister, Ida. She had a small group of friends. They were all deathly ill with typhus, including my mom, but she was the strongest. She could crawl. So at night she would go outside and dig holes in the dirt and hope, pray for rain so she could cup water in her hands and try to give her girlfriends some water, some nourishment, something. Um, didn't work. The, everyone died but her. Um, anyway, the British uh, liberated the camp and they were literally thousands and thousands of dead bodies all over the camp when they got there. It was hard to imagine. I don't think the British knew how to cope with their feelings of seeing this devastation. So they opened the vaults and they told the prisoners, go take whatever you want. And the only thing my mother really wanted was a clean sheet to lie on. And she got it and she said she was happy. Um, and then I heard that the guards, they had captured uh, Bergen-Belsen guards and they made them dig the graves for the thousands and thousands of bodies that were left in piles all over the camp. I think that was really good judgment and justice. Okay, I have had what I think is a remarkable story having to do with my mother's liberation. I was in Sydney, Australia, and I went to the Jewish Museum there, and I really didn't go to study up on the Holocaust there. I went to find out about Jewish history in Australia, but they had free Wi-Fi, and they had a small uh, Holocaust exhibit in their small theater, so I went to sit down there and check my emails and uh, Facebook, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw this film loop, and it said uh, liberation of concentration camps, and then I saw Bergen-Belsen, and, you know, I thought, well, let me see what it says. And there was a picture of my mother with two other women. She was smiling. She had broken teeth. She looked very young, but I could tell it was my mother. Um, people there thought I was having a heart attack. I screamed so loud. But it was one of the most wonderful things that's ever happened to me because I know when people see these pictures of the prisoners at the concentration camp, you can't help but look at them. But when I look at them, I'm looking for my parents, never thinking I'm gonna find them. So this was really a remarkable thing that happened to me. Okay, so to continue my mother's story, uh, my, my mother and her sister were resettled at a displaced persons camp in Bergen-Belsen. They had no home, no skills, no family, and very little hope for a future. My mother knew they had an aunt and uncle living in Kansas City, and she wrote them a letter. Uh, here it is, and I'll read it to you now. This has been translated from Yiddish. Um, a cousin of mine found this when she was cleaning out her mother's um, things. Okay, dear aunt and dear uncle, I can let you know that we are in Bergen-Belsen. For four years, we were in the concentration camp. It was very bad. We were very sick with typhoid, but now we are all well and healthy. We have no news about our dear parents. Three years ago, our dear parents and Franya and her dear husband and children left, and we are so lonely and miserable, like a stone. We only have you left, and we beg you to care about us, to come to you. We beg you, dear ones, to write to us. It is for us too expensive. Like from our dear parents, we would like you to know how you are. If you and your children are well, 
We hope so. We hope that the sun will shine on us and everything will be good for us because we had to go through so much heartbreak. We live together here with the, I don't know what the name is, but with cousins of theirs. We stop writing now and greet and kiss you, my dear aunt and uncle, with love always to your dear daughter and her husband too. We await good news from you, my dear ones, your dear sister's daughter, Royza, Royza and Yaja Wies. And when I got that letter, it broke my heart. But what happened was her aunt and uncle, Louis and uh, Gertrude Ziegler, began the process of getting their nieces to Kansas City. They finally arrived in 1948. Once settled in their home, my mother uh, began a job at a textile factory and also began taking English and citizenship classes. And shortly thereafter, she met a really good looking newcomer from Poland, my dad. Well, my dad was a character, a one of a kind and my hero forever. He was one of seven children, five brothers and two sisters. He was somewhere in the middle he was born and he grew up in Wafsławic, Poland, and went to school, played soccer, took boxing lessons, and followed his older brother around. I'm sure he was a handful because he grew up to be a handful. His deaf grandmother lived with them, so he also knew sign language. All of my life, my dad would let go of bits of his childhood, so everything always came as a surprise. He never sat down and just told us his story. I knew when the Germans invaded his family um, that the family was moved to a ghetto. They shared an apartment with multiple families and just getting through each day was hard, but they were all together. One day, his older sister met her gentle best friend at the fence that separated the ghetto from the city. The friend had brought a loaf of bread for her and she threw it over the fence for my dad's sister to catch. A guard happened to notice it. He shot my dad's sister and he shot her best friend over a loaf of bread. Uh, soon after that, the ghetto became, it began emptying um, as people died and others were sent away by trains to whatever concentration camp the Nazis were sending them to. My dad was taken to a labor camp. For the next four years, he was shuttled from one labor camp to another and was used as a slave laborer. Back at home, his parents, his grandma and his youngest brother were sent to Treblinka. Treblinka was a concentration camp whose sole purpose was to exterminate Jews. After years of transfer, from labor camps to Nazi war factories and concentration camps, my dad landed at Auschwitz. He was given a tattoo and it, he admits it took him a few days to understand where he was and what Auschwitz was about and he couldn't believe it. He found a friend from home and they decided they would rather try to escape than stay there. And they did, they escaped. Uh, they ran into the woods, they found a farm, and then they heard uh, dogs, and they knew that the Nazis and their dogs were after them. They saw a pile of hay, a haystack, and they jumped into it, and they thought they were safe. They didn't realize the dogs could smell them. So they were caught. Now they were brought back to the camp, and they weren't killed immediately. The way that they dealt with the prisoners was they would put them in, I don't know what it's called, we couldn't find the word for it, but their head and their arms would go through a wooden block and their backside was ex exposed and they would get 25 lashes on one cheek and 25 lashes on the other cheek. And then they were dumped into a barrel of water. Now, if they came to, they could live. If they didn't come to, they were sent to the crematorium. My father, luckily, 
he came too. Every day was a lesson in terror. During roll call, it wasn't unusual for the guard to just say, okay, count off to 10, and whoever was number 10, when they were dumped into a barrel of water. If they came to, they lived. If they didn't revive, they were sent to the crematorium. Every day was a lesson in terror. During roll call, it wasn't unusual for the guard to ask the inmates to count off to 10 and shot number 10. Killing Jews in Auschwitz was the reason the place existed. My father said he always thought he could make it one more day, but he was reaching the end of his rope there. But it was 1945 and the Nazis knew they were losing. And so they loaded my father and thousands of others up into another train. My dad was on the train for days, no food, no water, very little light and crammed in with hundreds of other people. Just bodies crammed in together. My dad was so weak and sick and he was sure that he really couldn't last another day. And then the train stopped and the doors were pulled open. He heard the jeeps before he saw them and that's how he was liberated. In the middle of who knows where, he was free. The Americans who liberated them gave each prisoner a packet containing a stick of margarine, a tin of meat, a bar of chocolate, and cigarettes. My dad and many of his prisoners, my dad said many of the prisoners died in the following days from eating such rich food. They'd been starved for years and their stomachs couldn't handle the kind of diet, that kind of diet so soon. But my dad lived. The first thing he did was to return to his home in Wafswavik and try to find out where his family was. A neighbor was living in their home and told my father that his family had all perished and that if he didn't leave, he would be dead also. And that was the last my dad had anything to do with Poland or wanted to. He spent the next few years living in Landsberg in a displaced persons camp. Um, he tried many different things. He tried immigrating to Argentina, but something was wrong on his chest x-ray and they wouldn't let him in. So back he went. Then he went to France and boarded a submarine with Jewish activists trying to sneak into Israel. The British caught uh, the sub and turned it around. And so he was back in Landsberg. One day he saw a notice about going to America and honestly, he was like, why not? He had no plans. He was, he was spinning his wheels. He was lost. So he uh, signed up and boarded a ship and landed in New Orleans in 1950, in October of 1950. He landed with nothing but an empty suitcase, $20 in his pocket, and a new top coat. New Orleans was hot. He couldn't wear his top coat. The city creeped him out because the cemeteries were all above ground and he just didn't understand that and didn't like it. And he wanted to leave New Orleans. Now, President Truman was everyone's hero because he had ended the war. He was certainly my father's. And someone told my father that President Truman was from Kansas City. My father's next question was, is it cold in Kansas City? And when the answer was yes, he boarded a train and came to Kansas City with his top coat. The Jewish Federation got him a job at Rothschilds and um, the rest is kind of history. Um, and that's a true story. That's how he ended up in Kansas City. Jewish, uh, let's see, where am I on here? Okay, so they got him a job, they got him a place to live and uh, they signed him up for, he also signed up for English and citizenship classes. And uh, the refugees there, these young people, they had parties on the weekends. And my dad went to one night and there was a girl singing for everyone and he wanted to know who she was. Well, that was my mother. They met and three months later they were married. They wasted no time uh, after 
going after the American dream. I was born 11 months after they married. My dad was promoted as head of tailoring at Rothschilds and my sister was born three years later. They had found a community in the New Americans who had also immigrated here. My childhood memories are so full of parties and picnics and get togethers with 10, 20 or 30 families. I considered them my family. And because we were kids and second generation, we were the ultimate revenge for Hitler because they didn't want our parents to live and not only did our parents live and prosper, but they had another generation. We were cherished not only by our parents, but by my parents worked hard and they wanted the best for us kids and they finally made it into the middle class. They bought a home, then a car, joined a synagogue and made sure we were part of that golden time, the 50s. I was in Girl Scouts and took dance classes. I had Jewish friends and non-Jewish friends. But one thing I always knew, even before I knew their histories, was I was a child of survivors and they were special. In 1955, my dad bought a small tailor shop in Brookside. It grew into a men's clothing store also, and he was in business for almost 50 years. We couldn't go anywhere that my dad didn't know people. He had local celebrities as customers and some uh, big fish like Chief Kelly, who was chief of the Kansas City Police and became uh, the FBI director. I got to meet President Truman because his doctor was a good customer of my dad's. To this day, I meet people who loved my dad and tell me stories I never knew. In 2016, Midwest Center for Holocaust Education received a donation in my dad's honor. It didn't say Leo Zemmelman, it said Leo the Taylor. When I wrote this stranger back to thank him, he told me that as a teenager, his family had lived close to the shop and my dad would tell this man his philosophy of life and that he had carried my dad's words and wisdom with him all these years. That was my dad. My mom never worked outside the home, but she was, she sure worked in it. She was such a talented woman. She could sing, dance, paint, do calligraphy, landscape like an artist. She didn't cook, but we didn't starve either. My friends loved her. She loved to tell all of us stories from when she was a girl. And she almost always concentrated on the good things in her life rather than on her horrible concentration experience, concentration camp experience. And yet I always knew deep down that they suffered. They probably never told us the most horrible things they went through, but they always told us that love, life is meant to be lived and live it they did. Most, time, most times they were more fun than us. My mom was always up to any adventure I wanted to go on. And my dad thought nothing of showing up at my house at six in the morning to go feed the swans at Loose Park. They were given a second chance and they ran with it. I still miss them every day, but I live by the lessons they lived by. Always have hope, appreciate what you have, judge people by their character and enjoy life. This is for you, mom and dad. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the first picture of my parents after the, at my wedding. This is a picture of me as a candlelighter at Yom HaShoah. This is a picture of Sosnowitz, Poland that I took in 2003 when we visited there. This is a picture of my mother's dad. She always carried a picture of her father around with her everywhere. And I mean everywhere. He was on at the head table at my wedding. This is a picture of her oldest sister, Franya, and her husband. This is a picture of Abramush, Franya's son, when he was a baby. This is a picture of the new Americans in either their English or citizenship class once they came to America. This is a picture of my family and I 
standing in front of a sign in Wawsławik, Poland in 2003. And we had gone to these two towns looking for information about my parents. This is a picture of my dad's sister, Itta, who she was the one who was shot at the fence trying to catch a loaf of bread. This is a picture of my dad uh, what, with his tattooed number, which he used to tell people was either his lottery winning lottery number or his girlfriend's phone number. This is a picture of my father after the war in Landsberg. This is a picture of my parents when they had entered the middle class and we were enjoying all the nice things in life like traveling to um, Toronto for a wedding. This is a picture of my father's store, the famous Leo's Tailor Shop. This is a picture of my father and my daughter feeding the ducks and swans at Lewis Park. And this is a picture of my parents living the good life, enjoying being in America, driving a convertible and showing Nazis. They got the better deal. Two, one. Hello, I am Ida Colpin, daughter of Holocaust survivors, Maria and Fred Davinke both of blessed memory. It is my honor to introduce one of the most traditional and meaningful parts of our memorial service, the lighting of six candles representing the six million Jewish victims. Throughout the world in similar ceremonies, candles are lit in remembrance of six million Jewish men, women, and children murdered in the Holocaust. The memory of the Holocaust reaches across our community, touching each of us. Today, representatives of six special groups will light candles. Holocaust survivors, children of Holocaust survivors, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, youth program participants, Jewish war veterans, and the greater Kansas City community. Erwin Stern will light the first candle on behalf of survivors of the Holocaust. Susie Katz, daughter of Holocaust survivors Rose and Leo Zaltzman will light the second candle on behalf of the second generation. Jeffrey Kovitz, grandson of Holocaust survivors Rose and Leo Zaltzman will light the third candle on behalf of the third generation. Emma Jacobson, participant in Together We Remember program will light the fourth candle recognizing young people who are committed to community service and civic engagement. Mark Slatkin of the Jewish War Veterans will light the fifth candle, honoring men and women who served or continue to serve in our nation's armed forces. Michael Abrams, chair of the board of the Jewish Federation of Greater Kansas City, will light the sixth candle on behalf of the entire community. We invite everyone watching to light their own candle of remembrance. Thank you. Yeah.
although we are remembering, since this video has been pre-recorded and we are not together, we will not recite Kaddish Atom Mourner's Kaddish. I invite you, though, to join any of the virtual minyanim taking place in the Kansas City area. You can join B'nai Yehuda at 5.45 p.m. tonight via our Facebook page for our daily minyan, or go to kcrabbi.org, the website for the Rabbinic Association of Greater Kansas City, to learn more about other options in our community. Instead of Kaddish, though, I would like to share an alternative with you. Psalm 138. A Psalm of David. I will give thanks to you with my whole heart. In the presence of the mighty will I sing praises unto you. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks unto your name for your mercy and for your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day that I called, you did answer me. You did encourage me in my soul with strength. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, God, for they have heard the words of your mouth. Indeed, they shall sing of the ways of Adonai, for great is the glory of God. For though God be high, yet the lowly are regarded and the haughty known from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you quicken me. You stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand saves me. God will accomplish that which concerns me. Your mercy, O God, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your own hand.